Okay, today we're going to, we'll start by doing a problem or so on relative motion and maybe it might take a few minutes to see if you have questions about recent homework. And then the other topic we want to get into today is constrained motion. It's where one body frequently is hooked to another body, usually through a cable type of linkage. So we'll address that, okay? So first of all, before we maybe answer a relative motion questions or actually do a problem or two in class, is let's see if you have any questions about the recent homework. Anyone? You all catching up? Or so far behind you don't know where you are? Anybody? <laughs> okay. Uh, regarding the homework that I returned to you on everyone's paper, even the ones that I considered to be exceptional, you could always, there's always room for improvement. And what I'm trying to get you guys to do, your math is looking really good. Most, almost everyone is putting nice step-by-step -step mathematics down, but that doesn't quite cut it in engineering. We want you to start putting English remarks in there as to why you're doing something. You know, noticing that at the top of the projectile's path, the vertical velocity is zero. Next line would be the equation with that vertical velocity component equal to zero. That kind of thing, just a little short, don't have to write big long sentences, just little short phrases describing the process and your thinking that's going on or observations that you've made. The other thing to try to do is to include some sketches about the behavior that you might be noticing. Like I noticed uh, one person on the very first problem in assignment three, I think there was a uh, acceleration given and it was something looking like this. I, let's see, anybody, that first question on that assignment three, there was an acceleration field given. I can't quite remember what it was. I think it was G minus CY squared. C, yeah. C Y squared. Mm -hmm. And what one person did, I think only one person that I noticed did this, they had an upside down parabola, right? Mathematically looks like that with this initial value here as g. So they had a sense, they had a sense of this particle under the action of g uh, being the acceleration at position zero and then it's gonna be decreasing as position y changes. So you can get a little insight from those kind of sketches. So keep an eye on the mathematics and if there's something that looks reasonable, you might wanna draw a sketch like you've seen me do on some examples in class. So I highly recommend that you try to do that. Um, if it's really neat, looking really sharp, where I probably couldn't do any better myself, that's gonna be an A plus. English comments thrown in, sketches, and problems done. Uh, an A is if it's looking good, everything's there, and the steps are shown, but maybe it's lacking some in English comments. That would definitely be worth an A and then it steps on down from there. And so what I'll do when you take the exams is I typically I'll thumb through your notebook fairly quickly and I look at that cover sheet to sort of see where you don't have problems finished and I kind of thumb through quickly the work that you've done and then I look at the attempts you've made on those problems where you had some trouble. And then I give you a letter grade for it. If you don't like the letter grade, come see me. I won't move it down, I might move it up. Okay, if you have a good story, okay? So I won't take the grade down on it, <laughs> okay? So, all right, so no questions about recent material? All right, so let's come over and look in the book for a second at a relative motion problem. And I picked out this one. It's a little bit, um, because of the, at least on the image up here, because of the book not laying flat. We have a Ferris wheel rotating clockwise at three revolutions a minute. That is a fast Ferris wheel. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Three revolutions, that's a revolution every 20 seconds. So that's a fairly fast thing. And then at the same time, there's a car 
is a two-dimensional problem. A car moving away from the Ferris wheel, traveling at 18 kilometers an hour. And it's also, notice up here in the statement of the problem, it's also accelerating at three meters a second. And we want to determine the velocity and the acceleration of the car relative to an observer B. And B happens to be in a chair on the Ferris wheel at this particular location at 45 degrees off the horizontal up here. And that observer is looking at this vehicle moving away and accelerating. All right, everybody understand the statement of the problem? <coughs> Okay, so let's go ahead and see if we can tackle that, come up with the answers that they've provided there. So we have a Ferris wheel. The position happens to be at a particular location of 45 degrees, location B. And then we have the automobile. And I think they label that A, is that correct? A, and it's moving at what speed? 18 kilometers an hour. Okay, the velocity of A is 18 kilometers per hour. And so, just so, and, oh, what's our radius on the Ferris wheel? Nine meters. Nine meters. So we want to right away make sure our units are consistent. So we know there's a thousand meters, one kilometer, and there's 3,600 seconds in an hour. So our units reduce properly. Exactly five meters per second. That's nice. Must be a textbook problem. <laughs> five meters per second. And at the same time that the car is moving, the Ferris wheel is rotating clockwise with an omega of what? Three revolutions per minute. Three revolutions per minute. So let's turn that into radians per second. So there's two pi radians in one revolution. And there are 60 seconds in one minute. And that turns our problem then into radians per second. And notice that the 6 reduces into this, so it's pi over 10 radians per second. Okay, how many of you do unit conversions kind of in your head or you just grab your calculator <coughs> and punch it out? No. You all write it down? Or just like that. that. Yep. I write pretty much. Okay, I and you probably learned it like me that by screwing up frequently by trying to do it in your head or just grabbing your calculator. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even after all these years, I still write these things down because it's very easy to get these things upside down. Sometimes Not I just use Google. Hmm? Sometimes I just use Google, but yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah. But but you're going to be. I mean, the, uh, most of these things you'll be doing so frequently, you'll become comfortable with it. But I highly recommend that you take the time to just write it out. Matter of fact, I joke around in courses, uh, math or engineering courses, that who wins the race, the hare or the tortoise? The tortoise wins the race because the tortoise does what? Plods along step by step, writing every step down, <laughs> taking their time, thinking as you go. And the, the hair is zip, 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 half of it done in the head, and you screw up, and then you got to go back to ground zero, and you actually waste time. Okay, so I highly recommend that, at least from my own experience. Okay, so what are we doing? Here's our object B, person B, person A. We have to write a relationship, and they ask us in this question to find the what? The acceleration and the velocity? Yes. Okay. The car relative to the observer. Okay. 
So we want the acceleration vector form of the car A relative to the observer B. And we also want the velocity. Now this is a pretty straightforward problem, but I wanted to make sure we go through another one of these just so you can just lay it out and just do the algebra. So if you aren't sure how to write the darn equation, then do as I suggested the other day in the last class, is take an arbitrary reference and this position vector points towards B, this position vector points towards A, and we want to make sure we're the observer here. And I oftentimes will write that down. And I'm imagining myself from here looking there. So I want to make sure that my position vector comes from my observer to the object of interest. So the position of A relative to B. So this way you can see the addition of the two position vectors here is equal to the position of A. So that's typically your starting point. And once you have that, you then take your derivative Oh, one other thing in your work, and I did not look for this in your homework assignment I glanced at. Be very careful to include vector notation on vectors. If they don't have the vector notation on it, it's considered to be in a scalar value, a magnitude. So you'll get in the habit of doing that, and you'll be communicating much more effectively. Okay, so the velocity, we've got this. It looks pretty nice here. It's just 5i. If I define the traditional x and y, if we don't see a reference in your work like this for x and y, then it'll be assumed to be in the standard. Okay? The too, by the way. Yeah. Well, I'm doing velocity, so I'm not too nervous yet <laughs> about the acceleration there. Okay. So now on the velocity of b. circular path. So the velocity of observer B <coughs> has to be tangent to the path, which we know then is perpendicular to the radius of the circle, of the circular path. And that speed is going to be 9. The speed of B is going to be equal to r omega which is going to be your 9 meters per radian. Oh, actually, and we'll go ahead and I've mentioned this earlier in the course, but the radius is actually considered, I consider it to be a conversion factor to allow me to take rotational information and transform it into linear information. In other words, rotational velocity and turn that into linear velocity. So 9 meters is equivalent to 1 radian of rotation. And our rotational rate is pi over 10 radians per second. And you can see clearly that the radian units disappear and you end up with your meters per second. So the velocity of B is then 9 pi over 10 meters per second. At this direction, in this direction, so notice a little extra geometry here is this then is 45 degrees. So you can see that you have a positive component to the right and a negative component downward on that velocity. So what we can do is take this magnitude, 9 pi over 10, and multiply it by a unit vector. And I'll just go ahead and use I'll mix ij notation with angle bracket notation. And so all I need then is a unit vector <coughs> describing this particular direction. So a cosine 45, comma, and minus sine 45. 
plus the unknown relative velocity. So that'll answer the velocity question then. So finally, if we finish this off by coming down below, then we can solve that for the velocity of A relative to B. He's going to be collecting the I terms over here on the left side. So we have 5 minus 9 pi over 10. And this is square root of 2 over 2. You should know that. I hat. And we move the J hat term to the other side and it becomes positive. 9 pi over 10, sine of 45, square root of 2 over 2 as well. J. And we could just tidy that up with a denominator then of 20 in both those terms. So there's a expression for that, relative velocity. Now the acceleration problem, separate problem. Everybody okay with this calculation so far? Anybody punch numbers for me there? Well, <coughs> actually, it's, it's the it's, same as in the book. It's in, thanks. Which happens to be approximately three, three i hat plus one point nine 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 j hat. Three i. Interesting. Plus. 1.999J. Oh, also on your work, make sure you include your units, which I should have tagged on over here. So that's the relative motion. So it appears, if I'm, if, like, imagine the car scooting out along the floor over there, and I'm on this merry-go-round coming around heading downward. So it appears that that vehicle is traveling away from me at three meters per second and coming up towards me. Why does it appear to be coming up towards me? Because you're going down. And down. Yeah, it makes sense because I'm <coughs> descending, right? We're descending while that vehicle's scooting away from us, so it appears to be coming up at us. You ever had the experience in a plane looking out the window and seeing another plane on a different path not too far away and it's just it's bizarre sometimes it, it just looks like they're doing some really strange kind of motion and I always think about relative I don't get out my scratch pad and start working on problems <laughs> <laughs> some engineers might question let's let your hand go up Tina. yes um, if, if we didn't have as nice an angle as 45 degrees if they said for an angle theta how would we go about that? Well, we could just put theta in here and carry that through the problem, couldn't we? And, and it end up just living in our solution down there. And then we would have theta written into our solution right in here. It'd be tucked in right there. It'd be a cosine theta and a sine theta term right there. Okay. And that's all. And then it would hand, Then we would be able to handle any location on here, couldn't we? We can handle any location on the Ferris wheel. That's why I was not an acceleration because I was solving it. Yeah. I didn't realize it was all T0. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's not, and matter of fact, you'll see us do this as we get further into the course. We will work <coughs> problems frequently. Matter of fact, this happens in engineering oftentimes. You will take and you're trying to come up with some generalized behavior that you can then come up with governing equations that you might program into a computer or hand to a technician to do some calculations for you. You give them the kind of formulas you want to use. Well, oftentimes what you want to do, if it's complex, is you'll work it out with some specific values like this, writing each step out, and then you'll go back and generalize it. Then you'll have a generalized expression, like I just discussed with you here. So you could actually come up with this pretty nicely with a cosine theta term right here, and a sine theta term right there, and it would work perfectly fine for any defined location on here to get that relative velocity. As a matter of fact, just think about it, we won't do it, but imagine that B is down here now. 
what are you going to expect? You're moving at this speed that way. The vehicle is moving at 5 that way. It would be the net sum of those, wouldn't it? The net sum of those. And would there be any vertical? No. And that term will go to 0. OK? OK. So you can, you can work these out. And you have to be careful, though, if you generalize it. You have to be careful on how you define your direction for theta and then to make sure that these terms come out properly assigned. Okay. So you can't just plop theta into that expression because of the way it's defined up here. Uh, I'll show you how you can do that later.